You always got to make sure the technology's working right. There it goes. Well, good morning, my friends. It's good to see you. Uh, good to see some of you that we haven't seen in a while. I'm glad that you're here and comfortable coming back out. So, uh, tremendous pleasure to be with you. I'm glad to see Scott and Karen back from the beach uh, down on the spring break time. So, I was actually a didn't do a beach in, but I had the pleasure of doing a wedding yesterday out in Union Point, Georgia. I had no idea that city existed until I had to go do a wedding there. Uh, but beautiful, beautiful location. I really enjoyed seeing that couple come together. Um, talk about flipping a, a, a reception and a, and a rehearsal and everything real fast. Once that rain rolled in, we're like, oh, we're not doing an outside wedding. Now we're doing an inside wedding. Um, it made it come together, but it was, uh, it was just gorgeous being out there. Uh, so I'm glad that you're here with us. Welcome to everybody online as well. Um, as we always say, this is a safe space of grace for you. Um, and as you may have seen the church sign out front, uh, you know, I believe that we're in a season of hope. Uh, that's what I'm continuing to trust in, continuing to believe in. Um, and we're going to keep saying that as things continue to unfold, hopefully in the direction we're looking for. Um, we are in a new series called I Am. We're looking at the I Am statements of Jesus um, we started last week on Easter Sunday, I thought rather appropriately, with I am the resurrection and the life. Um, and today we'll continue in that as Jesus says that he is the bread of life. Um, and we'll see exactly what that means. So I'm actually going to lead us in a couple of songs. Um, if you may or may not have picked up a program as you came in, but um, we're actually going to share communion at the end of the message today, just so you kind of know when that's coming. Um, and we'll take that together. I thought it would be appropriate to take in communion after talking about the bread of life and what that represents. So uh, uh, let me open up with a word of prayer and then we'll sing a few songs together and then uh, kind of unpack a little bit of what Jesus had to share with us. So the divine creator, thank you again for the gift of a Sunday morning. Uh, thank you for the safety of uh, this place that we are in physically, uh, those joining us online and the, the virtual space and the safety they find there. Um, may this just be a time where our hearts can be open to hear directly from you. Um, soften our spirits, God, kind of ease any anxieties that we may have. Uh, may this be a time where we can grow, uh, where we can be encouraged. Um, God, maybe, maybe we could just be, uh, and that would be our height as well. Um, we thank you that you offer all of that to us. Uh, and we pray this in all the holy names of God. Amen. Let's sing I Need Thee Every Hour together. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine can be afford. I need thee, oh I need thee, every hour I need thee. Sing a 
song called uh, The Wonderful Cross uh, that you may or may not be familiar with. I think the, the words certainly would be familiar to you. Uh, and, and I know sometimes we think about something like the cross and we think, how can that be wonderful? It was awful. It was painful. It was sacrificial. But I think it's wonderful in some respects just simply for the love that it represents. The great love of Christ for us. And while it was awful for him to go through, he did it with a greater purpose in mind. The idea of unifying us with him. Of freeing us from sin. Of bringing us together. And kind of guiding us down a pathway of a better way of living. So that may that be kind of your spirit's focus as we sing this together. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my
Well, I've never had to do this myself, <clears throat> but I work with a guy who has done this many times, um, and he worked in human resources for a multinational company, and he tells stories often about union negotiations. Um, you know, growing up down in the, you know, Daytona Beach, unions weren't as big of a deal down in that area of the U.S. We just wasn't talked about very much. It wasn't like something you heard about like you hear in other areas of the country. But you think about union negotiations, and there's always just this subterfuge. There's a word for Sunday morning, right? <laughs> there's hidden agendas. Um, there are conversations that are layered in secrecy and unexpressed desires, right? People are trying to get to a certain location. People are, are trying to, to get what they want, but they're not always being very direct about it, not always being very honest about it. And sometimes we even fall into that same trap, not necessarily from a union perspective in negotiations, although I saw a couple of heads nodding like, yep, been there, done that, I know what's going on, how that works. But I, I think just even about the conversations that we often have, are, are we always very honest and direct about our needs? Are we always very honest and direct about what we're feeling and what we're thinking, the things that, that we are experiencing? See, we're going to look at a passage today, and, and I told you Jesus talks about being the bread of life, but he does this as a result of conversations that he's having with people that are following him. And they're expressing a desire for something, but he is able to kind of cut through all the fat, if you will, to kind of cut through all the extras that they're throwing around and get to the very heart of what it is that they're actually looking for. And before we jump into this text, I'm going to give just a quick bit of background. This is a really jam-packed time in Jesus' life, especially as we read here in the book of John. And we're going to be in chapter 6, looking at verses 22 to 35. But, you know, Jesus has had a lot of stuff happening in a very short period of time. You want to talk about a power-packed weekend, if you will. This is what he's got. I mean, first of all, he has fed 5,000 people. With what we know was, I mean, a couple of snackables, right? I mean, not, not a whole lot of food. A couple of people had a tuna fish sandwich packed, and Jesus feeds multitudes with this. That unto itself is a monstrous miracle, all right? This huge event that takes place. And then after that, right, the, the crowd kind of disperses after the teaching. The disciples go across, and then Jesus walks on water. So not only does he feed everybody... Right? and pulls surplus where there seems to be scarcity, but now he overcomes the elements and he walks across water. So all of this happens leading up to the fact that people wake up the next day and they can't find Jesus. So here in verse 22 to 35 of chapter 6, we're going to look at this. Because what we see already is that Jesus has met the physical needs of people. He's given them something that's pretty incredible. And here they are wanting more. They want more. They're stepping back to the negotiating table, and they're going to ask for some other things. But let's start in verse 22 of chapter 6. It says, The next day the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there, and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but that they had gone away alone. And then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. 
And once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. All right, so we took three little verses right here and just kind of glazed over this. But here, essentially what's happening, this is the moment in the, uh, the mystery show that you're watching when the people are trying to put the clues together and figure out what the heck's going on. They're starting like, wait a minute, wait a minute, there was only one boat. His disciples were here and he didn't go. What? Something happened. You know, I can't, the rustling starts talking, people are gathering, there's always one person who goes, I have the answer, and everybody's like rolling their eyes, oh, that guy again, here he comes trying to tell everybody what's going on. There's, there's a whole lot of unpacking that doesn't happen that we don't get to see because we just have these simple verses of things taking place. But what we can certainly grab from this is this simple principle, these people wanted to find Jesus. These people wanted to find Jesus because they were the ones who had experienced the food that he had provided for them, and they we're hungry again. It's morning. Y'all wake up hungry? I mean, maybe, you know, I know we talk, some of you don't eat right away. You don't want to eat right, but at some point you're going to have to eat, right? Because you're like, the last thing I had to eat was like six o'clock dinner or that 9 30, 10 o'clock snack. We won't talk about that. <laughs> but that was the night before, right? But you, you get to the next morning, you're hungry again and you're looking for a source of food. You, you have to have your needs met once more because we do know this about us, right? Our needs can be met in the moment and then those needs are going to rise up again they're going to come around another time you haven't had one delicious dinner in your life you're like well i guess i'm done with dinner for the rest of my life because that's about the best i've ever had no because you're going to talk about that now you may be full for a while right unbuckling the pants sitting on a couch going oh but you're going to want to eat again guaranteed and that's exactly what is happening with these people they are looking for more verse 25 when they found him on the other side of the lake, deductive reasoning, folks, here we go. If they found him on the other side of the lake, they had to cross the lake too. So it wasn't like they just, you know, start texting people. Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen, I haven't seen Jesus. They actually had to go searching. They put some effort into this. So now they've crossed the lake and they found him and they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you were looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. See, Jesus steps up to the negotiating table and says, yeah, don't act like it's holy purposes you're looking for. Y'all hungry. You want what I can do for you. You want me to do something miraculous again and give you another delicious sandwich. But then he takes him to the next level. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Well, then they asked him, well, what must we do to do the works that God requires? Do you understand what they're asking? Like, how can we earn this? What, what gold stick, sticker do I have to have? How many, how many uh, days of perfect attendance do I have to have? How many assignments do I need to turn in? How many Bibles do I need to have in my house? How much money do I need to give to the church? I, I need to know these things. Tell, give me the marks so I can hit those marks. They're looking for those works. And then Jesus answered, the work of God is this. And I imagine he paused. And it's just a verse for us, but I mean, again, communicating is storytelling. And this is a master storyteller in Jesus. And I imagine he paused because he knew he had his crowd in the palm of his hand. The work of God is this. And they all lean in, trying to hear what he's going to say. Take notes, write this down. To believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, all right, well, what sign then will you give so that we may see it and believe you? You know what they're saying? Prove it. G give, give us more. Now, hold up. What just happened the day before? Didn't he prove it then? 
Man, you took a kid's lunch and fed 5,000 plus people and had leftovers. And they're like, well, I, that, was, that was, you know, yesterday. I mean, what, what, what do you got for me today? What, what are you going to show me today? What will you do? I mean, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. Of course, they're speaking of the Israelites and Exodus and how God provided for them. In fact, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, well, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. And whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. You kind of get how they're talking to each other, but they're not talking to each other. Because <laughs> they're talking about one thing and they're trying to have some physical needs met. They're, they're searching for some satisfaction in the temporary. And Jesus is trying to guide them to something bigger and better and longer lasting and more fulfilling. See, bread, as he talks about it, bread is a staple of the diet. I mean, it's a staple of yours and mine, right? Unless it's, you know, gluten-free. <laughs> but that's, that's a common element, right? I mean, we, we grew up dirt poor. I mean, we were so poor as kids. But, I mean, there's always a loaf of bread in the house. There's always a bread store selling day-old bread. We could get bread. We did. Now, sometimes we, we used to eat what we call a jam sandwich when we were real poor. Y'all know what that is, right? That's two pieces of bread jammed together. <laughs> yeah, nothing in between them. <laughs> but we ate that jam sandwich. Two pieces of bread jammed together. That's the way it was. <laughs> If you got lucky, maybe a little butter in between to soften it up. But bread is a staple of the diet. It, it, it has always been that, that simple matter of substance for us. And Christ is talking about that, yes. But what he's trying to get us to understand is that, that bread is to the body as Christ is to the soul. That as we rely on the simplicity of that little thing that everybody makes and bakes and grabs and eats and it's part of almost every meal in some fashion, that he says, I can be that for you. And he's trying to tell them, listen, I'm prepared to share gifts with you. I'm prepared to share graces with you. I'm prepared to share comfort with you. All these things that the kingdom of God provides. Because what Jesus does so often for us is he works through the physical to highlight the spiritual. Part of it's because we're physical and spiritual creatures at the same time. We're both of those things. And sometimes... Our physical needs are so great, and they cry out so much, they overwhelm our spiritual, don't they? Anybody who's worked in education or worked with kids can tell you, if a child is hungry in class, your odds of teaching them and reaching them are minimal at best. you got to fill the bellies. That's why we have breakfast programs and lunch programs and snack bags and things you send home with kids. Because we know if you don't feed their belly, then all they're going to hear is that rumbling of the stomach. That's all they're going to pay attention to. Why do you think Jesus talks so often about feeding people? Part of it is, well, I could wander off. I'm not going to do it, I promise. Well, you know, it's part of it's a community piece that we grow together. That there's a letting down of your defenses when we sit and we eat together. There's a, a gathering that happens when we sit around a common table with each other. But there's also just the importance of having your physical needs met, that that's absolutely essential. And while Jesus, and don't miss this, while Jesus is pointing to the higher level, to the spiritual level, He's not ignoring the physical either. Both matter. They both matter. And Jesus is going to meet both needs. But as he meets some of these, I don't want to call, I don't want to call them lower because they're important, but some of these more basic needs that Jesus meets, he does that as he guides us to step into this higher level dependent relationship with him. Because the simple truth of this passage is that Christ provides all we need. Y'all go home. Christ provides all we need. 
And sometimes we've just got to continue to remind ourselves of that. He provides everything that we are looking for. But if we want to grab that truth, then we've got to admit what we're looking for. We've got to realize it ourselves. Go, go back into the text. Verse 24, crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there. Then they did what? They got into the boats. They went in search of Jesus. Look, let's go find him. I know he's the key. They clearly, based on the continuing conversation, didn't understand all the levels and layers, the intricate details of that relationship that Christ was offering, but they knew they needed to look for him. They were looking for that connection. Jesus even calls him out on it in verse 26, doesn't he? Because very truly, I tell you, you're looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. You had a good lunch yesterday. That's why you're looking for me. Now, there is another layer to what they're doing here. I don't want to get off too much into this, but they recognize that something miraculous had happened. Please don't think that they didn't understand that a big deal had taken place, but they were all thinking short-term, short-term, short-term. So like, I need another sandwich. I need another physical need mitt. But they're also looking at this going, man, this guy's got to be our king. We're, we're under this Roman oppression right here. We don't like the way that the government is structured. This is the guy. I mean, he's already shown us that he's capable of doing some things. Let's make him king now. Let's, let's seek him out right now because I want him to change everything right now. And Jesus is trying to tell them, you don't see the big picture. That I, I am going to be king. I am going to change everything. But I'm doing it in my timing, in God's timing, not in yours. But I think for us to continue pushing forward to follow Christ, we have got to admit what it is we're looking for because that helps us you know so often if we're only in a relationship we're just looking for somebody to give 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 right have you ever seen people in those relationships maybe you've been in one of those relationships whether it's friends or family or dating you watch all of this and you think man that person's just using you they're only in this for what they can get from you they're not looking to contribute to this relationship this this is not a healthy dynamic and the way these people are talking, it sounds like they're only in it for themselves. But Jesus tries to redirect them. Do you notice that? I mean, he understands their motive. I mean, he speaks right, too. He's like, eh, let's just let's cut, the, let's cut the junk out, okay? Let, let me just tell you exactly why you're hearing what you're here for. But did you notice that there are no words of condemnation when Jesus speaks to them? That even as he understands exactly what it is they're looking for, he just redirects. He tries to steer them to what's eternal. He tries to move them to what's better. And he does the same thing with us. I think it's okay to admit that, right, God, right now, I'm just mad. And, and I, I want my anger to not be overwhelming me. And I'm just mad. God, right now, my heart is broken. God, right now, I'm confused. I don't need a deep spiritual truth. I just don't want to feel the way I'm feeling right now. God says, okay, I see that. And I will meet that. But let me move you to another level. So I think perhaps as, as we start exploring what this looks like for us, maybe we just got to have some moments of honesty with ourselves. And you hear me often talk about self-awareness, self-examination. That We've got to take a good look at our motivation. And even in coming into a building like this or taking part in a service online, say, all right, what? What am I coming in for? Now, don't take that to mean that you've always got to have this like super spiritual high level. You're like, well, I'm always floating in the clouds above and I'm always at the deeper meaning. You know, sometimes we come in on a Sunday just because we need the comfort of people, right? We need the comfort of company to know that we are seen and valued and appreciated and loved. And some days, my friends, it's perfectly fine that that's enough. It's perfectly fine that that is enough. And God says, I can meet that need. And when you're ready, I'll take you to what's next. When you're ready, I can show you another level. Because what we're looking for changes what we find. Does that make sense? What we're looking for 
changes what we find. How many times have you absolutely overlooked something that was sitting right in front of you because it wasn't what you were looking for? You didn't notice it because it wasn't on your radar, even though it's sitting right there. Jesus wants to shape those things, and he offers solutions for us. He meets needs for us that we may not even realize that we have. So let's begin by admitting what we're looking for. And then once we come to that realization, then we can put effort into things that last. Verse 27 in this passage, we're from the message. Jesus says, don't waste your energy striving for perishable food like that. Work for food that sticks with you. Food that nourishes your lasting life food the Son of Man provides. He and what he does are guaranteed by God the Father to last. Invest energy, my friends, in things that endure. And recognize that as God tells us, what he offers that lasts is always available for us. There is plenty of it. And that it doesn't depend on us to provide the source, that he's the one that does it. So even when we're like, I've reached the end, I got nothing left. There's nothing left in my spiritual, emotional, or mental pantry. (laughs) The shelves are empty. God says, I'll fill that back up for you. Just make sure you invest in the things that endure. You probably know some of the history, and I just touched on it briefly. I, I won't wander too much into it. If you go back to the book of Exodus, and the Israelites are obviously out in the desert, and they're hungry. They need some food, and God provides manna from heaven for them, this, this substance that falls that they collect every day. And they're told, you, you collect what you need for the day. You eat what you need today. Don't collect extra. And if they do, it turns into worms, and it's nasty, right? So he's trying to teach them a lesson of depend on me for what you need on a daily basis. Well, the people that Jesus is speaking to they know the history of manna this whole idea of of bread from heaven they get that concept because they know their life history they understand that provision so they're looking for that again but what they're looking for again is they would just want manna to fall from heaven and god's like i i did that i can do that but that's not going to meet your spiritual needs that's not going to take you where you need to go because what is material can only provide satisfaction for a short period of time. It's like buying a new car, right? You, you love a new car, you love the bells and whistles, the new car smell, but after a while, it's no longer a new car. It's just a car. I mean, it still gets you where you want to go. You may still enjoy your car. You may like the vehicle that you have. But it doesn't have that same sense of the brand new where you couldn't wait to tell people about your car, right? Couldn't wait for people to see the car, walk out and take a look at it. Things change. I love technology. I do. I wish I didn't love it as much as I do. You know, they come out with a new iPhone, and I'm like, ooh, look at that. Look at all the fancy stuff it does. I remember when I got the phone I have now, how excited I was and played with it and adding the apps and tweaking and moving and... And after a while, now it's just a functional tool, right? I just use it to do what I need to do, and it helps me along until I buy the next new one. Then I'll get excited about that one, and then after a while, it gets old too. We've got to invest in the things that last. And often, just as we see in this passage, and I think we often see in ourselves, sometimes we get caught looking for short term instead of focusing on the long term. And as I told you, that doesn't mean the short term is irrelevant because when you're hungry, you need food. To meet the needs of your body is absolutely necessary for your survival. But to meet the needs of your spirit is essential for you to thrive. And Jesus says, I see both. I can meet both. Don't settle for just the short term. But recognize that if we put our efforts into truly following who Christ is, that he can lead us to those deeper truths. He can lead us to that better purpose. 
And the, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and say this. I, you know, I kind of jumped on the people here because they were asking about what works. What works can we do to get that? How can we earn that? And we we're like, oh, you faithless fool. You just want a checklist of things to do. But, but let's, let's take the other side. My family calls me the grace guy because I'm always like, well, think about what they're going through. Think about what they're thinking and feeling right now. So let's, let's do that with this group of people. They ask, what works can we do to get this? You know what that means to me? They were willing to invest. They, they didn't ask for a handout. They said, what, what do we need to do so that we can receive that? Now, they were missing the whole picture of grace, right? We can recognize that, like our, the missing out that God is trying to say, listen, you can't ever do enough to get it. I'm just going to give it to you out of the abundance of love that I have for all of you. I'm, I'm the one that just gives this gift. This is how this works. But at least they were willing to say, what can we do? How can we shape our lives? What, what energy, what effort can we put into this? I, I think that's actually an admirable thing. Because they were willing to do their part. And Jesus said, let me take you to the deeper truth. Let me show you this matter of faith that is essential. That this is not about your physical efforts. It's about your spiritual focus. Because satisfying God is not about the work that we do. But it's about whom we believe in. And that's what Jesus said. Just believe. It's very simple and yet very complex to do, isn't it? <laughs> Just believe. And as we believe, I think we'll turn that corner and we will begin to find complete satisfaction in Christ. Go back to verses 32 to 35. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. And whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He says, I am what you're looking for. And I will leave no need unfulfilled. Friends, if we seek the spiritual, we will find our physical needs met. That's what I tell people in, in marital relationships. We talk about, I got to have my needs met. Got to have my needs met in a healthy relationship. And I say, listen, here's, here's the honest truth. If you will commit yourself to meeting the needs of your partner, and they are committing that way as well, you'll find that both of your needs are met. You don't have to start put a high on the grocery list. It's going to happen. When you're in a healthy dynamic of a relationship where you're both trying to figure out how to meet the needs of the other person, then you're both going to be fulfilled. And that's exactly the relationship that God is offering for us. He says, I will meet your needs. Who else is going to know them better? You may not even realize the layers that you have, but I promise you I can meet that. He says, I will satisfy your soul. I will bring you peace, I will bring you direction, I will bring you courage, I will bring you guidance, I will bring you love. Jesus is one-stop shopping. He's like Bucky's. Some of you familiar with Bucky's? It's this, I, 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 to call it a convenience store is almost an, an abuse of the word convenience store. I, I've not been inside a Bucky's myself, but I know they got one in Warner Robins, Perry area, and of course I, my hometown Daytona Beach just opened theirs. And I'm watching my friends talk about, took the kids to Bucky's today, so exciting. I'm like, it's a gas station. <laughs> really? They're like, oh, it is so much more. I'm like, really? I mean, it's like a QT on steroids. This, this, this is where you want to go? They're like, oh, we got T-shirts and like 97 kinds of jerky. And uh, we got the stuffed Bucky. And the, the, I was like, I, I just want gas and a cup of coffee. I mean, I'm, I'm a real simple fellow. <laughs> I just I'm, I want inexpensive gas and, and probably cheap coffee too. I don't care. But if you go to a Bucky's, you can get just about everything. You, you can buy clothes. You can do your Christmas shopping. Some of y'all be getting Bucky's for Christmas. I can see it coming now. It's kind of like, here's your beaver. And uh, I think it's a beaver, right? Yeah, here's your beaver and here's your T-shirt. And here's your jerky. Merry Christmas, son. Jesus offers the same thing for us. He says, listen, you don't need to leave. I've got everything you're looking for. 
and I will fulfill that need. And I think that in principle, we know that to be true. In principle, we know that to be true. But for us to really live this out, we've got to internalize the truth. We've got to take it in. We've got to meditate on it. And then we repeat. And sometimes we've got to have that kind of affirmation throughout the day. Maybe you've got to set a 30-minute reminder on your phone, and every 30 minutes you would be like, all right, I've got to take this truth in. I've got to meditate on this truth. I've got to remind myself that God will meet all my needs because God has a history of meeting the needs of his people. And all of our spiritual development is built on that affirmation that he provides it all. So the question is then, as we look at this story, where are you at? Because if we're going to try and sum this up, maybe with one simple question, let me do it this way. Are you looking for the hand of God or the face of God? You're like, what? what's the difference? Well, if something's in the hand, I'm handing it off to you. You're just looking for what you can get. For looking for the face of God. We're looking for relationship. We're looking to know. We're looking to grow in understanding, to believe more fully. Now, God doesn't say, when you're not looking at my face, I'm not going to give you what's in my hand, because he's a good, generous God. He's still going to meet our needs, even if our motivation is a little off. Even if we're not really clear on what it is we're looking for, God says, I got you. I'll still take care of it. And as you keep coming, I will develop true faith in you. And you will start to see the long-term plan of what it is I'm doing in your life. And you will use your time, and your talent, and your resources to further grow. You as individuals, you get a chance to do that. And then watch as we grow as individuals, what happens? Our, our faith community changes and grows. The community that we live in changes and grows. And we become those influencers helping other people see that Christ provides all we need. Which I think is an appropriate time then for us to share in the physical of communion that leads us to the spiritual. You know, we eat food consistently to sustain our physical life. But for that food to do you any good, what do you have to do? You've you got to internalize it. You've you got to take it in. Then it actually benefits you. Let's just be completely honest. This little piece right here that we're going to take together in just a moment, so be patient. This right here is not going to make you go, well, I had communion. I don't need any lunch. I'm good. I think I'm fine. But hopefully it can fulfill a spiritual need for you. That as you take this in, you take in and receive the truth of who God is. And that you realize that I will never truly hunger and thirst again if I allow God to be the one that guides me and fulfills my need. And as I told you, bread is the most universal food item, right? Well, that's why Christ uses this to make that same parallel. That he can be the most basic food item we need as well. Available to all who are willing to take it in. So let's remove the wafer, my friends. And let's take in that communion wafer together. The body of Christ broken for you. Obviously, we understand the significance of the grape juice and what it represents, as we sang even in the wonderful cross this morning, of the blood of Christ that was shed for you. Take and drink.
And before I close this in prayer, I thought it would be appropriate for us to just simply sing the doxology together. So let us do that, my friends. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Jesus, we thank you that you indeed are the bread of life. Adam, we're, we're going to keep repeating that truth that all of our needs can be found and fulfilled in you. Meet us where we are, God, and guide us into that deeper, closer relationship each day. Thank you, as always, for hearing us better than we are speaking in our prayers. And we pray this in all the holy names of God. Amen. Be blessed. Peace and grace to you all, my friends. Have a wonderful week. Thanks online.